Coming up on DTNS, using a moth antenna on a drone to detect smells, why Uber is not giving up on autonomous cars, and how to deal with TV subscription fatigue. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, December 8th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the, oh, well, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. <laughs> Don't go off script, Roger. It's hard Sorry. to improvise. I know, I know. Uh, joining us today, host of AVXL, Patrick Norton. Welcome. How's it going, man? I am delighted to be here. I am full of mirth and good cheer. And indeed, uh, we were just having a great conversation about moths and seagulls and why the California funny. seagull is the state bird of Utah. You got to get that wider conversation. Good day, Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Couple of Google notes for you. Samsung announced that Google Nest devices will become works with smart things certified. That means that your Nest thermostat, your camera, and your doorbell can all be controlled through the Samsung Smart Things app and also stream to Samsung TVs and refrigerators. <laughs> should you so desire. Google also confirmed to The Verge that all Stadia users will be able to live stream directly to YouTube starting Tuesday. 9 to 5 Google noticed the feature started rolling out yesterday, Monday. Research organization IPVM shared a document with The Washington Post showing Huawei facial recognition software has the capability of sending automated Uyghur alarms to authorities when its camera system identifies a member of the Uyghur ethnicity. The document was found on Huawei's website and removed after the Post and IPVM asked for comment. Huawei and MegV say it was, quote, a test, and it has not seen real-world application. Engineers at Cloudflare and Apple have developed a new internet protocol called Oblivious DNS over HTTPS, or ODOH. I like to think of it as ODO. That makes it harder for internet providers to know which websites you visit. So instead of a browser simply using a DNS resolver to convert a web address to a machine-readable IP address, which is how it works, it's an encrypted process, though. So ODO <laughs> decouples DNS queries from the user by encrypting the DNS query and then passing it through a proxy server. The proxy server knows who's requesting it, but not what site, and the DNS resolver knows what site they're requesting, but not who was requesting it. If you'd like to know a little bit more about DNS and how it works, check out our Know A Little More podcast episode about DNS at knowalittlemore.com. I like to think the Odo is a reference to Deep Space Nine somehow. <laughs> Two Imperial College graduates have developed a browser called Zane, spelled X-A-Y-N, meant to protect your privacy while still customizing things like search results. The user will train the AI on its preferences by swiping on things like news headlines. It then uses the ZayNet framework, which was developed for uploading anonymous machine learning data to a server before sending a refined model back to your phone. Zane, again, X-A-Y-N, is available for iOS and Android. Google announced an app called Look to Speak to help people with speech and motor impairments communicate better. With a phone positioned slightly below eye level, you could look left or right to choose from a list of phrases, which the device then speaks out loud. The phrases can be personalized so that the user, uh, through the user, though that setup is not accessible by eye gaze, so it still requires some assistance. Google found that the app was helpful in environments where other accessibility devices weren't practical, such as in transit, if you're in the shower, uh, if you're in an urgent situation, or maybe if you're outdoors. Look to Speak is available on Android 9.0 and newer, including Android 1. All right. Let's talk a little more about Uber and its autonomous car plans. Indeed. So this story broke right at the end of DTNS yesterday. Uber announced uh, on Monday that it's sell sell selling its self-driving unit Advanced Technologies Group, also known as ATG, to Aurora Innovation, a competitor to Uber. The deal is expected to close in Q1, but if you think, well, is Uber given up on autonomous vehicles? Maybe not. Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi will join Aurora's board, and Uber and ATG investors and employees will own 40% of Aurora following the deal. Uber will also invest $400 million into Aurora directly, and Aurora's autonomous cars will eventually operate on Uber's ride-hailing platform. 
Aurora was founded by Google's former lead engineer for autonomous cars, Chris Urmson, along with Sterling Anderson, who helped lead Tesla's Model X project, and Drew Bagnell, who ran Carnegie Mellon's research lab and worked on autonomous vehicles at Uber. So they all are in the space. And Gadget's Matthew Beatum notes, notes that this may be Uber outsourcing the hard work in a way that minimizes risk but still lets Uber reap the rewards if it all works. Yeah, the, the whole idea with, with Uber uh, developing autonomous cars was that eventually that would reduce costs because it would have autonomous cars taking people around instead of having to pay drivers. And if we set aside Uber's totally fraught relationship with drivers and how much they pay them for a second. Uh, you, you can see why that would make sense just in, in a general, you know, like, oh, this will be cheaper. We could we could make cheaper fares, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I do think that you, you called Aurora a competitor, and that is true up until the point that Aurora gets Uber's ride hailing or, or, or autonomous car business, at which point I guess they stop being competitors and start yeah. being collaborators. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Patrick, I mean, you were Uber, raising your hand. I yes, was. I, go ahead. Part of me always thought that that some aspect of their effort, if they had, if, they've obviously spent a huge amount of money and resources on autonomous uh, vehicles. But part of me always thought that Uber's move in this direction was part of the reason they got such a ridiculous amount of funding in the earlier VC stages. And then we're going to eliminate the cost of drivers. <laughs> like, like, well, yeah, and I mean, two years ago, that was still absolutely the play. It was you know the the drivers were. The, you know, the first version of what would eventually be, you know, a bunch of autonomous cars taking people around everywhere. Obviously, 2020 hurt some of Uber's business pretty right. heavily. You know, a lot of people aren't sitting in the back of cars anymore. But Uber Eats has seen a huge uptick because people are at home not wanting to go out and they're still wanting food. So I think that the company is saying, listen, if Aurora can do the hard stuff, and and we can take a big stake in the success that the company has in the future. Why wouldn't they? And they're yeah. trying to save money. And, you know, I mean, Uber has had no end with Anthony Lewandowski and, and the whole lawsuit with Waymo, uh, with the death uh, of a person uh, getting struck by an Uber autonomous car that had a safety driver who, who didn't do their job. Uh, th you know, this has been difficult for Uber. And I, I think that also makes sense to say, let's hand it over to a company that's doing very well. Aurora uh, has Fiat Chrysler, it has Hyundai as, uh, and, and several other people as clients. Uh, so this makes sense to, for Uber to say, you know, maybe we're not the organization that should be running this and we should invest in and, and partner with a platform that can provide this technology to us when it's ready. Apple introduced the AirPods Max over-the-ear headphones this morning, supporting high fidelity and spatial audio, adaptive EQ, and active noise cancellation. Uh, they feature 40 millimeter dynamic drivers, Apple's H1 chip, that's the same one in the AirPods. Uh, that means you can use active noise cancellation and transparency mode with Windows, because that H1 chip will, will activate that, uh, and Android. Uh, you cannot use the spatial audio. The spatial audio requires a connection to an Apple device. A digital crown is on the headphones to control your volume and playback. Uh, activate Siri, answer phone calls. A separate button switches between active noise cancellation and transparency mode. On the AirPods Pro, you, you kind of hold for a long press. On the new AirPods Max, you just tap that button. Apple says you should get 20 hours with active noise cancellation and spatial audio enabled, so pretty good battery life if it meets what they're saying. Apple says the knit mesh and the headband reduce pressure, so it should be more comfortable. Uh, there's memory foam in the ear cups, which they say will create a better seal. Uh, that's not cheap. Replacement cushions are going to cost you 69 bucks each. AirPods Max, AirPods Max come in gray, silver, blue, green, and pink, and can be ordered in the U.S. for $549. That's more than the bows PS5. they're selling for right now. <laughs> uh, with shipments starting December 15th, uh, and Apple also announced Apple Fitness Plus will finally launch December 14th in the U.S., U.K., Australia, Canada, Ireland, and New Zealand. It's 10 bucks a month, 80 bucks a year, or if you pay for Apple One Premier Bundle, it's included in that. That costs you $30 a month. Patrick, uh, you're the host of AVXL. What do you make of these headphones? One of them. <laughs> I, I don't know. I was kind of staggered, like a lot of people, by the price. That's a pretty impressive price for noise-canceling earphones, even from Apple. Um I, I, I pre-ordered a pair, going to get them, very curious. I'm feared that it will be a lot like many of the wireless Apple products where any improvement, because the previous product was 
so awful. People will be like, they sound amazing compared to... And it's like, no, they don't. If you buy a competing product at the same price, it'll probably sound better. Mostly I want to see uh, what they've done with the noise cancellation, given that uh, so many of the patents are nailed down on that by other companies. I'm very curious to hear what the microphone quality is. Mm-hmm. If they can do a really yeah, good It has like nine mics. microphones in it or something like that, right? So, Well, I think it's nine for the noise cancellation and three for your voice. For voice. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a lot of mics. <laughs> I, you know, there's so many microphones. It's a little kind of dis- disturbing. I have to say, I have the AirPods Pro, and the active noise cancellation is quite serviceable. Uh, it it knocks out leaf blowers and and airplanes. Yeah. It is weird where it doesn't work. It's it's very you can tell it's been tuned to certain situations, and there are other situations where it just doesn't work because it wasn't tuned for that. I had that experience. I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, in the last year with some of Sony's uh, over-ear noise-canceling headphones. And one, it was kind of fascinating experiencing some of those because they the, the EQ in those is really bizarre out of the box, especially the low end, um, as in there's way too much bass. And uh, But it's also kind of, I'm very, very curious to see what the noise cancellation is like on this because the, I was, yeah, I was like, oh, the, the, the in ears, like the, the, the pods, the noise cancellation works, but it was weird how much it didn't cover, or maybe it's weird how much of my life, which situations it didn't cover, yeah, fits within the, the noise cancellation capabilities or, or a curve for those. And my first thought this morning when I saw the press release, because that's all it really was, is like, Gosh, that, you know, is, is Apple just kind of under the radar. But then I thought, OK, well, it wouldn't have made sense in the a- Apple Silicon, you know, Mac announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago. Eh, it just didn't really work. Probably wouldn't want to bundle in uh, an AirPods Max announcement with the uh, redesigned HomePod because <laughs> it gives people less of a reason to buy a HomePod, right? Because you're like, oh, I'll just get the, get the uh, headphones. And also the price is pretty high. So it's like I think it's Apple saying we're in the holiday season. Let's see what we let's see what we sell. You know, get them out there, and then we can make them part of maybe a bigger Apple Music push the next time we want to talk about that. Yeah, I am uh, excited about Apple Fitness. Uh, I I don't have an Apple Watch, so that's something that I will have to come to terms with if I want to use it in uh, in any realistic way. But I think that for anybody who is reconciling the fact that they might not go back to a public gym uh, anytime soon, 10 bucks a month for something that you use a lot. Again, it always depends on how much you use it, but that's a, that's a pretty cheap gym membership. Uh, If you've got, if you've got an Apple TV or, you know, you want to cast it from an iPhone or something to a, to a monitor, uh, it's kind of cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it out. A few people sold off some Peloton stock today after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Peloton. Engineers at the University of Washington, nothing to do with Peloton in this sense, have developed a small drone that uses moth antennas as chemical sensors, and they call it the Smellicopter. The team took the antenna from a common hawk moth and then mounted it onto a drone, connecting each of the antenna to a thin metal wire. The antenna's status changes when it's exposed to a certain chemical. The platform passes a light electrical current through the antenna to monitor that status. If it loses a scent, it can automatically fly crosswind until it picks up the scent again. The moth antenna is fast, it's reliable, and it's more accurate than traditional sensors of the same size and power. Of course, it can only detect some chemicals naturally, so one of the next steps is to figure out how to reprogram it to be able to pick up more. The hope is that it could be used for things like detecting gas leaks, detecting unexploded IEDs, search and rescue, etc. The paper on the Smellicopter is published in the journal Bioinspiration and Biometrics. Biomimetics. Biomimetics. Because it's mimicking, mimetic. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, uh, when I watched the video for this thing, I had no idea how big a hawk moth <laughs> antenna was. It's, it's big and long and fuzzy. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, when they bend it over and, and, and attach it to the wires, uh, it really does work. They, they were showing it going after a flower scent. So they had it hooked up to the drone and they had the flower scent being blown by a fan and they kept moving the fan and the drone would stop and then find it and then start heading towards it. Like, uh, Essentially, they said, look, we tried all kinds of materials to mimic this and nothing worked as well as the actual moth antenna itself. Hmm. I love it. 
uh, moth to a flame or something. Uh, but or, yeah, this is, this is, this is or it's gas neat. Leak. Hopefully, no flame. <laughs> yes, yes. Hmm. Hopefully, you know, stay safe, everybody. But yeah, smellicopter uh, using uh, hawk moths. Yeah, Who shout knew? out to the University of Washington for for an excellent name <laughs> on your product there. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show, folks? More moth stories? Let us yes. know. One way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories of vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Oh, streaming services. They are hot. AT&T CEO John Stanky today told a conference that HBO Max subscriptions rose from $8.6 million at the end of Q3 to $12.6 million. As of early December, at that same conference, NBC Universal CEO Jeff Schell said Peacock passed 26 million signups as of Monday, up 4 million since October. We talked about the possibility that Warner Media might have a couple new services out there. Uh, we talked about Discovery Plus last week uh, launching. And you may think, well, wait a minute, how am I going to afford all this stuff? Here's some stats <laughs> to consider. In March, Decision Data put out a survey and found the average U.S. cable package cost people $217.42 a month. That's how much people were actually paying for their cable service. Now, that usually includes Internet. Sometimes it might even include phone. Uh, but you still save money when you cancel that TV part. A study from CG42 found people shaved an average of $85 a month when they cut out cable mm -hmm. TV. Uh, a study from Landescu uh, put the average closer to $115 a month. That's how much money people have to play with once they cut cable. Now, I usually take that and I compare it to an over-the-top streaming service like Sling TV or YouTube TV. Uh, if you apply it to that, you definitely could save some money. But what about Netflix? What about Hulu? What about Disney Plus? What about Peacock? What about HBO Max? What about Discovery Plus? Do those count too? I Because I used to say, well, you were going to pay for Netflix and cable TV anyway. It's just an added feature like an HBO or a Showtime. But there's so many of these and they feel essential. Patrick, I know this is a, a question you've been wrestling with. <laughs> Oh well, I was we you and I were going back and forth in email before this episode, and I was laughing because I wanted to talk to you about this because I think you're the only person I know who probably subscribes to more things than I do, um, and it was I think it was the the, the Discovery Plus announcement really kind of pushed it over the top for me where I was sitting there and saying like, okay net okay Amazon Prime I get that with with you know Amazon Video I get with Amazon Prime, but it's you know, there's Apple TV Plus and there's Netflix and there's, you know, I, I started rattling off all the ones and it's like, OK, I got a Stars subscription so I could so I could see uh, 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 American Gods. And it starts adding up. Right. If you want all the new Star Trek stuff, you need CBS. Um, and it's I was sitting there and uh, I was laughing in pre-show and we were talking uh, uh, before the show Good Day Internet because you know, it's been so long since I've had cable or satellite. I was flabbergasted by the two hundred and seventeen dollars and twelve, you know, like forty-two cents a month. I'm like, is that, is that include phone? Is that, is that just cable services? That's ridiculous. Um, but you know, I'm still also at one point. I think I was paying like a hundred and forty bucks for not much in the way of cable in the Bay Area, and uh, it's interesting to when you start looking at like how do i parse this should i buy the season of the show i want do i have to wait for the season of the show i want because of the you know the, the windows appearances is everything changing uh in uh in 2000 or is it you know 2021 because you know all the theaters are still going to be a mess until this summer um you know if you want to see the new wonder woman movie and you don't want to go to a theater well you can see it on you know december 25th on hbo max it's been kind of crazy watching all of this evolve over this year and things that I've never seen out of stock before, like subwoofers from reputable companies or den and AVRs has been sold out. So I, I don't know. I'm, I feel like a lot of companies may be accelerating the launch of their online services mm -hmm. just to get them in and get people hooked before the end of the pandemic, which is cynical even for me or really practical for them. But it's kind of crazy how many different competing services there are from all the different studios at this point and Google and, you know, <laughs> the list kind of goes on. And yeah. On and yeah. On. I mean, they were all in the works, but right. uh, I, I think 
launch plans and promotional items, certainly things like Wonder Woman on HBO Max sure. uh, are, are definitely due to the pandemic. Like, like we say with so many things regarding the pandemic, uh, the trend was there, but it got accelerated, right? right. And I, I think that's true here too. I, yeah, and there's I, so many streaming services, but I, I know for myself, I'm a creature of habit. It's like there's only so many things you can watch in the f small amount of free time you have in any given day, right? So right. if I'm like, oh, I like things on Netflix. Oh, here's a series that's going to take me a little while to get through. I'm not like clamoring to, you know, buy a bunch of other subscriptions because I kind of got my thing and then you get used to it. And then you're like, oh, this is just what I watch because this is what I have the way that cable subscriptions used to work for folks. I mean, uh, $200 plus uh, per month, even with internet is, I mean, it's a lot of money. You can you can definitely whittle it down and save a lot of money and, and still see a lot of the stuff that you want to watch. But I think that the folks, you know, Discovery Plus, for example, I mean, wasn't necessary for Discovery Plus to roll out last week. I mean, I think that the network's like, we just got to get in there. You know, we got to be a player or else it's going to become one of these things that, uh, you know, early 2021, people would be like, well, I already subscribed to five cable cutting <laughs> services. Why would I bother? You know, I'm, I don't have enough time to watch your content, even if it's good. Yeah, I, I started listing it out. Netflix, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Stars, Amazon Prime, Apple TV Plus, Showtime, Criterion. And I think I'm missing at least one service. And I'm not talking about any of the monthly audio services that I subscribe to. Um it, it looks oh, these little... are your subscriptions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, it gets it. Yeah, you know. It's... So, so here's a few of my thoughts because I, I, I cover this very closely, not only here but also on Cord Killers, right. and I think all the companies looking at this are at the point where they realize there are still tens of millions of people in the United States who haven't signed up for one of these. So there's right. lots of people to go around and, and, and nobody's really behind at this point. So you want to get your service launched and out there so you can get your market, right? Discovery Plus isn't meant to capture the same group that Netflix is. Netflix is a wide appealing one. Discovery Plus knows there are people who love our programming and we want to get them when they cancel cable and we want to be there for them when they're like, well, I'm canceling cable, but I don't want to miss Shark Week or, or whatever. HGTV. TV, yeah, you know, yeah, or, or, or House Hunters. So so that's happening. And I think that the mental disconnect that's happening to a lot of people is, in the old world, you paid one price, you got most of the channels, you might pay a little more to get that one special channel, which you also had to pay for everything else in that tier. And then you decide whether you wanted to add Stars or HBO or Showtime to that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of Part of what was so crazy about that is, is there, we, we, you know, I, I remember seeing studies where they were like, okay, the average consumer has 400 cable channels, they skim 17, and 95% of their time or 90% of their time is spent on a maximum of four channels. So to speak to, to Sarah's point earlier, people watch what they want to watch very specifically. And we haven't got used to being in charge of that, right? The, <laughs> the mental space is... Well, okay, I could pay one price for live channels like an AT&T TV or YouTube TV, uh, and then I have to pay all this money for all the a la carte services, and I'm used to having everything, so I guess <laughs> I have to have everything. Uh, and no, you don't. Uh, the, the question I have is, which ones are like HBO and Showtime? Is Netflix a new way to pay for a channel or a new way to pay for a premium channel that you only have sometimes when there's something you want to watch on it? Uh, and how does Peacock fit in there? How does Hulu fit in there? It's a new model and you have control of it. I think it's a more complex model because yes. if you don't want to keep because things you have all, control, yeah. you, because you have control, you have to keep track. So the next phase of the cord cutting revolution, I think, and we're starting to see the hints of it with Apple TV plus and Amazon prime uh, and Roku is platforms that help you keep track of everything and manage your bill. So you only have one bill to pay and you can decide like, Oh, it'll make it easy to add and remove stuff <laughs> as shows come along that you want to watch. Well, and I think with the, uh, so many original shows that have been hits, um, then the whole kind of like, Oh, pay for cable TV still. Maybe I'm overpaying a little bit, but I get everything. It's just not true. I mean, I have conversations with my mom all the time where she's like, Queen's Gambit sounds good. What is it? Okay, Netflix. Uh, Mandalorian, Disney Plus. Yeah, they have Hamilton too. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, and so <laughs> it's like, none of this is anything that DirecTV was giving her for you know paying too right. much each month anyway. So 
All right. Well, moving on. Alistair Davies of the Zoological Society of London, quite a, quite a segue there, and Emily Duncan of the University of Exeter were among a group of researchers who wanted to study how plastic pollution moves through rivers and then out to sea. The team released 10 plastic bottles into the Ganges River in India. Each bottle contained a small cellular chip that connected every three hours to record how fast the devices traveled and gave the folks data. Each bottle was expected to upload about two kilobytes on each connection for an expected total 100 megabytes of data. So, you know, small pings. But one of them racked up 300 megabytes. When the scientists checked the location log for that bottle, they found it had left the river and gone into someone's house where it so stopped updating its location, but continued to rack up data charges. And it appears somebody found the plastic bottle, opened it up, took out the SIM card, and then logged into Facebook. <laughs> uh, so, so they cut off that service, uh, sadly, for that person, I guess. Uh, but uh, this this is a great study about about you know where plastic goes, and and it's a fascinating read on Ars Technica. The the whole thing about uh, you know getting technology into a bottle and some use GPS and some use SIM cards, depending on where they think it's going to go. Uh, but it, it was pretty funny uh, that, that somebody was like, Hey, that bottle's got an antenna sticking out of it. What's inside there. I'm going to take it home and look. <laughs> oh, wait, okay. a SIM card. This is great. Yeah. Hey, I, oh, cool. It works. Facebook. Hey friends. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from friend of the show, Allison Sheridan, a frequent guest. In fact, Allison says, this young man, Aspen Palatnik, developed an iOS-based app that will sequence DNA as a mobile genetics laboratory. She gave us two links. One comes from phys.org, that's P-H-Y-S.org. Uh, we'll have these links in our show notes. She says, this is a human-readable version of it. And then there's some more nerd-level details, but still kind of readable, from Oxford Academic. We also will have that link in our show notes as well. The Oxford app Academic uh, article is, is titled Comprehensive DNA Sequence Analysis on Your Smartphone. Yeah, they, this is great. So there are handheld uh, DNA sequencers now, but they had to be connected to a, a much larger equipment until this, until somebody's like, hey, why are we lugging around all these laptops and desktops to do this? Couldn't we do this on a smartphone and then just plug in the handheld sequencer? So... That's that's a uh, that's amazing. I mean, we've gone from you know millions of dollars and and months and months to sequence uh, a, a a string of DNA to doing it on your phone with an attachment, essentially. Very cool. Thanks to Allison. Thanks to everybody who sends us articles that we might not have seen otherwise. I appreciate all of that. All of your feedback is appreciated. In fact, and you can send yours, questions, comments, or otherwise to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also would like to shout out our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels today. They include Chris Smith, Martin James, and Agracia A. Daniels. Mm -hmm. Also, thanks to Patrick Norton, AVXL co-host himself. Patrick, how have you been since we saw you last? Uh, you know, just moving and getting used to an actual winter and leaves on the ground. Mm. <laughs> that I remember having to rake when I lived in that part of the country. <laughs> My boys were not really thrilled with that introduction mm, until they ran through not. the pile. Yeah. <laughs> Good times. Good times. Leaves. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> folks, go check out avxcel.com. It's A V E X C E L.com. We want to send you a holiday card if you're a patron and you haven't given us your address. Uh, you got a couple of days to do it. You got to get it in by December 10th. That's by December 10th. On December 10th, I will download the database and send it to David so he can start printing up the cards. Uh, some people have asked for electronic cards. I'll, I'll email everybody on Patreon a, a link to the digital version of the card if you want to see that. But if you want to get the physical one, check. If we've got your address, go to patreon.com slash pledges, uh, find DTNS, look in the right-hand column. If you want the holiday card, uh, make sure your address is correct and in there. Uh, become a Patreon supporter right now, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. If you'd like to join us live uh, Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, put it on your calendar. More at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back tomorrow with the one, the only Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>